Well, good morning, Calvary, as we have some people trickle in and trickle in on uh, YouTube. Please remember to say hello in the chat uh, on YouTube so we know who's worshiping with us this morning. Um, just a few announcements, some of our usuals um, below the, the YouTube uh, video, you'll see the links for um, joining the prayer room at the end of service, for joining in Coffee Connect at the end of service, as well as um, the offering uh, links. And remember, there you can give your offering through that online link or e-transfers or PAR. So just a reminder about, um, about offerings. And also our Lighthouse video link is also down there. Um, for anyone that hasn't been watching the Lighthouse videos, I highly recommend you going back and watching the, the great videos that uh, Kelly and her crew have put together for Lighthouse. As well, um, each Sunday we'll have the drop-in Lighthouse in the gym. So for anyone, any uh, kids grade 8 and below that are here. Uh, this coming week, we have our typical um, things running, you know, with, with everything online. So make sure you check those out. Um, as well, uh, stay tuned uh, for after Easter, we're going to start up some new spring groups. So more information will, will come on that. This Friday, we have exciting uh, Sing for Freedom. So... If, uh, if you still are unsure what that's about, um, you can go to the Calvary website, and it's there. But uh, you sign up to get the Zoom Room link to be able to listen to some amazing musicians, some of our own and some people that we maybe don't know. Um, this is a fundraiser for Aphrodite's family. As well, you have a chance to order desserts that get delivered to your door. And I haven't even told Brian, but he's going to get cherry cheesecake delivered on Friday night. His favorite. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so check that out. Um, you do have to sign up by this Tuesday. So don't wait too much longer. You only got a few days left. Um, so next Sunday, um, as we start into Holy Week leading up to Easter, next Sunday night will be our encounter service. So 7 o'clock um, here in person as well as online. So just remember, Encounter Service, to launch us into Holy Week next Sunday at 7. There will also be uh, Holy Week uh, devotion reflections on our website. Uh, so make sure you check that out. And then Good Friday, um, we're going to try something new, and we're going to do a gathering outdoors between uh, 10 and 12. So it's not a service, it's, it's a gathering. We're going to have different activities um, for all ages, and so we're kind of hoping that people will be able to join us outside. Uh, there will be a, a set time, I think around 11 o'clock, where we're going to do some worship. Um, but yeah, looking forward to that. And then Easter Sunday has been traditionally a time for um, baptism for believers. So whether it's a, a new baptism for you, um, whether it's renewing your faith uh, baptism, if that's something that has been nudging you, reach out to Drew um, for baptism on Easter Sunday. So, as yesterday was the first day of spring, um, you know, it was hard not to be excited, right? And, and so, yesterday I was just, um, you know, praying about spring and, and wrote some things in my journal here that, that I, I felt I wanted to share with you. I mean, it is, I think the excitement around spring was, was evident by many people, you know. It's hard not to really hear the birds singing see some flowers budding up through the ground, different smells. Everyone wants to get outside, so, so that's great. It kind of reminds us that people made it through the winter, right? Um, and it's new life. And when I, when I was praying um, yesterday, you know, God was like, but 
there's good news. In my kingdom, every day is spring. Um, and so, you know, of course, it brought um, the scripture, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17. So this is from the Passion Translation. Now, if anyone is enfolded into Christ, he has become an entirely new person. All that is related to the old order has vanished. Behold, everything is fresh and new, and God has made all things new. So, you know, then that made me think, how, how can I make every day like spring? And so here's a few things that I wrote down in my, in my journal that, uh, that God was speaking to me. Celebrate my salvation. Praise God every day. Be intentional every day to be renewed. Make it a priority to become deeply acquainted with God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. Learn something new about God every day. And share the good news daily. So that, that was just something that, that I, I wanted to share. And, and you might see a, a theme there about the dailiness. And I was like, okay, God, I got it. <laughs> Daily. I, you know, um, if I want spring to feel like spring and to have that joy, I, I need to do something every day. So will you pray with me as we head into worship? Dear Lord, Thank you that every day you shower your new mercies down on us. Help us to always see the new thing you're doing in our lives. Give us wisdom and strength to respond in a way that would please and glorify you. And God, keep our eyes open today as we head into worship. Let us fix our eyes on you. We pray all this in your son Jesus' name. Amen. So God, we just stop right now and we want to tell you your goodness. So I just want to invite you to make your own prayer right now. Whether it's about the times you felt him or the times you realize something about him or something about who he thinks of as you. God, we come to you and we want to thank you. You deserve our praise. You deserve that you would choose to love us so much, that you would seek us out. You work in our lives, whether we know it or not, opening up paths to new jobs, new understandings. You stir our hearts more than the sun breaking forth on a spring day. And God, we that you would help us to know you more because we know that that gives you pleasure and glory. We turn to you, our eyes to you, our hearts to you. Come, Holy Spirit, come. think I got it? Oh, I did. Look at me. All right. It's the new battery pack. Just checking it out. Um, we're going to, I just want to talk you through one quick thing, and then we're going to pray for the needs in our community. Uh, so, Steve, if you can pop that slide up really quickly. Uh, probably this hasn't happened for most of you, but COVID has made it difficult to plan things. Have you noticed that? <laughs> I know, it's just us. Um, so one of the things as we've been seeking feedback, because our heart here is to support each other and for our leadership to be supportive and, care and walk alongside each other, um, COVID has made that doubly difficult. Um, and so one of the things from feedback that we've got that we want to try just to say, we want to make this as easy as possible for people who are going through a struggle uh, wanting prayer, um, wanting just to talk through things. We want to be available as best as we can and get better and better at that. 
Uh, as a staff, we have incredibly gifted staff who can uh, meet you in different ways um, to care for you. So you don't have to come to me necessarily. You could, we have not only staff, but um, the pastoral care team is amazing. There are lots of people to reach out for. One of the ways that we want to signal and, and try to make, make it in the midst of lockdowns and lockups and all those things is on Wednesday mornings and Thursday mornings, we're setting aside some time where we're just saying, you know what? No matter what, we're going to make sure that we're around at the church or available on, for, by the church phone, uh, 11 till 12 and 6.30 to 7.30. One of the questions that was asked when we put this poster out to test it around was, does that mean you're only available for two hours a week? No. <laughs> No, quite the opposite. What we want to say is, you know how when you're talking to somebody and they give you their full attention? We have lots of things going on and, and, and we want to be available all the time, but we're, saying, we're realizing that we need some set times just so you know if you've been thinking, oh, I don't want to bother them, they're too busy, or uh, you know, maybe my need isn't that important. No, your need is so important that we're setting aside time and saying, it, even if nobody reaches out during that time, we're going to be praying for our congregation during those times. We're going to be thinking about you. We're going to be, but we just want to be available. Does that make sense? Sound good? Okay. Let's pray for our community. Will you pray with me? God, it is a beautiful spring morning. So thank you that we can be here in your sanctuary, which is far more beautiful, where you meet us exactly in all of your glory and all of your goodness and you open our eyes to, to see you and you open our eyes to see one another God thank you that we don't have to be doing well to come to you in fact you love to heal you love to restore you love to go and seek and to save the lost and so today we pray, God, for those in our community that are working through some stuff, for those who are struggling with anxiety uh, or fear or all the things connected to that, for those who are recuperating from sickness or waiting on diagnoses or trying to figure out what's wrong, for those who are struggling with their faith right now because it's a difficult time sometimes it's hard to feel you God we, we know that we can pray about these things because each of us here in this room have dealt with them all <laughs> each of us have learned that we can come to you in the midst of these things and one of the ways that you meet us is through one another and so we pray for Calvary that you would help us to be more and more better and better the place where people are welcome exactly as they are. A place where there is love and the grace that you have for us reflected through us and that you would teach us how to walk with one another through healing and restoration as you build us up and you use us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So uh, this word that we have back here, we're just kind of unpacking over the last few weeks. We talked about Zacchaeus, and that one of the things that we want to be as Calvary is that, that Jesus is one who seeks and saves the lost until they're found. And so one of the places we want to be is a place where people can come and be found by the King of kings and Lord of lords and know that it's okay to be seeking know that it's okay to realize at some point <gasps> I need something that I need Jesus I need help I need him in my life our I was <laughs> I'm not gonna go there I was told that if you say F and R it doesn't sound good so <laughs> R is all about restoring and we talked about that last week had this piece of furniture and got this got the uh, power tools out just to say you may find yourself in different seasons of your life having god point out to you an area that he wants to restore it's because he sees us as the treasure that is to come and he is delighted to draw close to us 
even if it hurts us, to, to restore us and so that his beauty is reflected in us. And we want to be a church, Calvary, that is okay with everybody from the person who literally crawls in and finds the way to the back pew to the leaders who deal with stuff because we are all being in the process of being restored to his image. We don't want to set anybody up on a pedestal and we don't want to um, say, oh, you're not, you're not in shape enough so you shouldn't come, right? That's who we are because that's who he is. And yes, we haven't done it well sometimes. And yes, we won't do it well sometimes, but that's the goal we're shooting for. That's, that's the lane of the highway that we're trying to drive in. And sometimes we drive like a toddler behind the wheel of a car, and sometimes we uh, drive well, but we're working towards that. And we're going to keep declaring, God is the one who seeks and saves the lost. And so we are. God is the one who restores us into his image. And so we are seeking to be restored. And today we get to talk about God is one who not only uh, seeks us and saves us, but he seeks to empower us, to fill us, to make us the place that he dwells in and he wants to work through us. And he doesn't wait until we're all restored and he doesn't even wait until sometimes we've figured out who he is. He chooses to work through us because that's how we were made. He made us to reflect his glory his love, his goodness, his grace. God empowers us. And so I want to talk you through a little bit of my story about how I've learned about that for me. Uh, and, and really, I'm just going to be fairly brief because probably one of the best people I know who creates pathways for people to walk in God's power and start to discover their gifts is Rhonda. Amen. Right? Yeah. And like, we are so lucky to have her here. And she's just going to get to speak. At, and I told her this morning, you could stand up here and say nothing. And just because God does that through you, we will be empowered. But it's going to be way better than that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> so when I was growing up, I grew up in the United Church. And I learned that, going, that being a Christian was all about doing things. Uh, I came from a long line of doers and, um, and especially doing things so that other people lo- notice that you're doing things, you know, like <laughs> one, of, one of my parents was very attuned to what was going on in the neighborhood and was watching what everybody else was doing as well. And, that's, and that was the image we had of who God was, that God is one who watches what we're doing and as long as we're wearing our polyester suits on Sunday and we're not swearing in front of our parents, we're probably doing all right. That was the list. Well, there's probably a few other things, but being nice is being a Christian, is what I grew up in. And so I had this idea that there was a list of things that I had to live out, and that's how you live as a Christian. Then I became a Christian. I discovered that God wants to actually know me and live me, and I have a relationship with him. And that's a whole other story. But what I did was I took that checklist mentality and moved it into my relationship with God. And so then the list became longer. I had to read scripture. I had to pray. I had to do good things. I had to, I had to serve. And, and every time I came across another Christian who was better at it than me, I thought, oh, now I have to do that too. I got to play guitar. And, you know, and, and all those things. Like it just became this long list. And I was experiencing God's love and presence, but I was also striving, running, trying to do my best. You ever felt like that? Probably just me, I know. But just on the slim chance that somebody is watching in somewhere in the foreign world, uh, you're not alone. I at least have gone through that. Okay. Then at one summer at Silver Lake, I'm camp, a camp that many of us are connected to, I met one of, I was met one of the counselors, and he told me his experience that he was at a, at a Christian rock festival, <laughs> and, and a guy had talked to him about, have you been filled with the Holy Spirit? And he said, I didn't know you could. And he said, well, come, and they just prayed for him. And I, could, I had known this guy all his life. He had gone to Sunday school with me, uh, and I could tell that there was something different about him. There was, he, there was a joy and a peace and the presence of God 
in everything that he was sharing that was different. And I imported my mentality. Oh, it's another checklist. Now I have to be filled with the Spirit too. And so I started praying more. And uh, not a good enough Christian, right? Because some of us live like that with God, that he's got a checklist. But this is what I discovered. When I did f finally, this was several months later, have this moment where I was filled with the Holy Spirit, received a prayer language, started to discover that the Holy Spirit wants to not only dwell in me, but dwell through me. That changed my life. I started to notice um, when I would lead worship, God's presence would come. That didn't happen before. When I would pray for somebody, God's presence would come. And I was starting to think, like at times I would think, oh, finally I'm checking off these lists. Now I realize, no, I was never meant to check off those lists. In fact, I can't do it. God wants to work through me, and that's what does it. God wants to fill us with his Holy Spirit. So I had that happening, but I also lived in, um, uh, started working in United Churches and, I, I, and United Church camps, and somewhere along the line, and I don't know that anybody ever said this, I, I was told, don't talk about the Holy Spirit. I don't know if anybody ever said that or I just thought that. And so for many years in, in this uh, youth program called Youth Events, in camps, in everything else, I would talk about Jesus. I would talk about following Jesus. I would talk about how worthwhile it is. But I would clam up about my experience of the Holy Spirit. About mm, 14 years ago, 13 years ago, God grabbed me by the shoulders. And he said to me, you are telling people all about being free, being found, about how he loves to restore people, about how he wants to work through people, but you are denying them the power that gives them the chance to do it. Because nobody can fill that checklist. It's my spirit working in people that allows them to love God and love others, that allows them to know his gifts, that allows them to know his power, that allows them to live the Christian life, that even know how to pray. All these things happen because he gives us his spirit. He makes us alive. And so I repented. And I told him, I will never be quiet about your Holy Spirit again. I'm going to learn how to talk about your Holy Spirit because... You not only died for me for my forgiveness, you not only work on me to restore me, but you work in me to empower me. And that's what makes the difference. In Zechariah, it says, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Not by might, you're, you're do, working real hard trying to fulfill the list. Nor by power, the gifts you have, your own, uh, your own gifts, your own talents, your own strengths. It's neither of those things, but by my spirit, says the Lord. And so when Jesus comes to his disciples after the resurrection, we're going to get there in a couple of weeks. When Jesus comes to his disciples after the resurrection, he says, First, the first thing he does is he breathes on them and says, receive the Holy Spirit. He's prepping them, warming them up. It's a taste of the Spirit. And then he says, wait in Jerusalem until my Spirit comes in power. And so they wait, and the church is launched when they have a similar encounter to what I have had many times and other people have had. It is when you allow the Holy Spirit to fill you, which is an experience, that God starts to move through you. So perhaps you're saying, uh, well, if this was important enough for Jesus and it was important enough for people in leadership here and it's and is important enough to never change the subject, what am I supposed to do with that? What am I supposed to do? How am I supposed to get filled with the Holy Spirit so that it's not another checklist, but so that I can be free from those checklists and just be free to let him find me, to let him restore me, to let him empower me so that I become, get to know him and others can know him through me. What do I do? 
Well, a couple things, and we're going to move into prayer now. One of them is listen to Rhonda. <laughs> right? <laughs> Another thing is, is start asking people to pray for you. That's what I did. Even in my striving, God, I think God laughed at me. Like, I, you ever wanted to give somebody a gift so badly, and then they're like st- running around striving, trying to get it, that they miss what you have for them? God longed for me to be filled with his spirit. And he even used me running around to try to get it. But I, just pray and ask people to pray for you. Multiple saints in our church have gone through this moment. I think it would be okay to share about Betty Wolf, who in her early 70s went to a church conference, heard somebody saying the same message, and said, I want that. In her 70s, having lived this beautiful Christian life of service for multiple years, received the infilling of the Holy Spirit. And she would declare that multiple things changed for her in that time. So, all right. One more thing. I want to give you a picture that multiple times God speaks to me in pictures. Sometimes they're like movies. One time, a couple years ago, in the sanctuary, I was praying, and I, God showed me a picture of people sitting around. And Jesus uh, was huge in the sanctuary and had this big sword. And at first I thought, oh, he's going to chop us all down. And, and then he came up to individuals, and he knighted them, you know, like laying the sword on their shoulder. And as he did that, which is, I understand now, him filling them with his spirit. And as he did, they became huge like him until the room was too big, too small for how big the people were. And then at some point, I remember yelling, let's go, in this movie that I was seeing in my head. I it was early morning, probably ate a bad burrito the night before, but I know that God was saying, I want to anoint my people so they become as big as I am, and I want them to go out into the world because people want to know Jesus' love and mercy, and they want to see his power moving. So, we are going to be a church that welcomes and seeks the, found, to, the lost to be found, that seeks to see people restored, and that recognizes on our own strength, we would just do church. But in his strength, we will see his kingdom come. Come Holy Spirit, come Would you pray that prayer like I pray every day Holy Spirit, fill me up I want to be a wick that you light on fire Nothing I have to do except place myself before you and say here I am Set me on fire Fill me up till I overflow Spirit. You can have a seat. I know I can't joke about this too much. Chris Drew would just say, just do it. I just want to just keep saying, come Holy Spirit. <laughs> uh, so empowered. That's, uh, that's, the word that we're, we're sitting in, and Drew set that up nicely, and I, and I love the places that, that he went um, as the foundation, as the, as the starting point, as that personal encounter with Holy Spirit. Um, when we've been talking about Empowered, um, a couple weeks ago, we kind of gave, gave a soft launch 
of some of these things. And I, and I use the image of God stirring us, not just to be spectators in the game, and, but, to be, but to be participants in the game. That God calls us not just to, to just sit and watch, but to be fully, fully engaged. Not just to come and, and, and watch or listen to what God is doing. Not just hearing about it in church or on a Sunday um, or even just singing about it. But he calls us to be actively in the game. And, and sports people, you, get, you, can, you can picture that, right? Like we've all, or even just we've all been spectators in the stands. And it can be exciting. It can be invigorating. The adrenaline can still, still get at you when you're in the stands, when you're in a spectator. Being part of cheering for Jesus' team is still exciting. And God wants us to be actively part of the game. He, he, he entrusts in us. He believes he wants us to affect the game, right? He wants us to use in our unique ways how we get to change the story, how we, through his spirit, he has a unique assignment for each of us, how we get to affect the game. How, how cool is that, right? Like the God of the universe with this power, with this might, chooses you and me to change the out- outcome of the game for people, for individuals, for communities, for the world. Right? Um, so I'm going to look at a story um, in 1 Samuel 14. Drew um, preached on this before, I think in a couple different um, kind of perspectives. Um, and we're not going to read the whole uh, scripture. I'm going to kind of walk you through the, the narrative. Um, it's the story of, of Jonathan and an armor bearer. Um, so essentially, we got the Israelites, and they're at war with uh, the Philistines, and the Israelites are getting totally outnumbered. Um, and King Saul uh, was the leader of the Israelites, um, and his, his son is named Jonathan. Okay, And so the two armies were kind of encamped on opposite ends of this kind of hill, and they're kind of positioned, and they're a little bit of a standstill, I guess you could say. And they were kind of at, at a waiting at out point because the Israelites actually had limited supplies and limited weapons. Um, and I encourage you, you could check out um, if you kind of like kind of narrative stories and, and a cool Old Testament story. First Samuel 13 and 14 is kind of the background and concept um, here. And, and um, Saul's army was, was depleted and, um, and kind of sidebar because Saul went on his own. Saul didn't listen to the, to the instructions of God, didn't listen to what God was stirring in his heart, and went on his own, and there's consequences sometimes when we do that. And so, so instead of, you know, instead of following what God had um, instructed of him, you know, he didn't. And so they were kind of stuck. So here we are, we read how the Israelites, including King Saul, kind of decided to hunker down. He actually hear that, like King Saul decides to plunk himself underneath a tree, take a breather, take a rest, for whatever reason. His son Jonathan, then you read, he gets a stirring in his heart, and he decides, I'm going after the army. He turns to his armor bearer and says, we're not going to sit anymore. He knows the power of God, and he trusts he's going to provide victory for him. You see, there there was an awakening within Jonathan that caused him to leave his space of waiting and sitting and begin a journey towards his call, towards engaging. So, so like I said, Jonathan is with a guy that you call an armor bearer. And this guy's job was, was to carry the extra army, the ar- an extra armor, maybe like his shield, and help protect him, kind of have his back, his kind of right-hand guy. And so, so Jonathan's suggesting that just the two of them go for it. Like, he's not rallying the whole army. He's just like, oh, you and me, let's go. And so when Jonathan suggests that and, and stirs up his armor bearer, that they get up and attack this massive arm, army, the armor bearer, you can throw out this scripture there, Steve, that first one, the first side scripture, he says, and Jonathan's armor bearer said to him, do all that is in your heart. Do as you wish. I am with you. 
Do all that is in your heart. You know, I I don't think it was just a, a testosterone moment for Jonathan. I don't think it was even a moment of a son trying to to impress um, someone or try and prove himself to his dad. Because if you read the rest of the story, you'll see how God blesses Jonathan's boldness and courage. And there's no way that, you know, they would have been able to accomplish it if it if Jonathan was just trying to be tough or strive or show off or have a to-do list. I believe it was truly a moment that God was stirring in Jonathan's heart, awakening Jonathan to a calling and sparking passion and momentum. And that, my friends, is what Holy Spirit looks like sometimes. Like Drew said, you are going to continue to hear us talking about the power of the Holy Spirit time and time again. That is something that this house will continue to speak to. And sometimes you're going to hear us talking about um, the overwhelming baptism of the Holy Spirit, that, that time when you invite Holy Spirit maybe for the first time to come and consume you. Other times you're going to hear about how Holy Spirit moves in us and, and through us and we see these powerful signs and wonders of Holy Spirit in action. And sometimes when we talk about the Holy Spirit empowering us and it not being our own strength and it not being our striving, it starts with Holy Spirit stirring in us, putting dreams in our heart, and ultimately awakening us. So you've probably uh, heard um, us talk about this phrase, the running after group, (laughs) yeah, the irony of Rhonda running, running, facilitating a running group. We've heard that joke, but we've been starting this running after group that comes after this question, what are you running after? What is God calling you? What is he awakening within you? And one of the questions I, I ask in helping people discern this is simply, what stirs you? What, what gets your heart racing or excited? And even just as, I, as, as I'm talking this morning, I want you to think about that. What stirs you? Can you think of a time when you thought, yes, I was made for this. This is my sweet spot. I'm not talking about your ideal vocation. It could just have been a moment when you thought, oh, this, this is it. This is it. I remember one of the first times um, I I really felt this was when um, I was a camp director also at at Silver Lake. And I'd been a counselor for two summers, and I'm sure um, kids were safe and cared for and loved. However, when I stepped into the role of directing, I got to spend more time engaging with the bigger team and developing systems and um, the behind the the scenes time and coaching. And I remember I would spend hours mapping out which counselors we're going to work with, which counselors, and and what some would say like an administrative Tetris game of how are we going to fit all the campers in the right size cabins because they all come with pairings and how they're going to fit together. And I, I loved that because I knew that that made a difference in the game. I knew that how we set people up and how how we connect people together in their spaces and in their spots, I knew that that helped determine a good week or a less than good week. And I knew that the time investing in in staff was gonna have a direct impact on their experience as campers. I knew that that was a way that I got in the game and in a way that God wired me. Some of you might go, that does not bring me life. That's, I want to be playing capture the flag with the kids. Or I want to be cooking in the kitchen. How has God wired you and makes you go, oh, yeah, this is what I was made for? Because guess what? You probably were by the God of the universe who wants you to get in the game. I, uh, we were just chatting. Um, we just finished a running group, and... and um, one, one uh, woman participant, she, she's pretty comfortable in, in kind of, she knows how God's wired her, and she's very pastorally anointed and, and cares for people. And so she was like, yeah, yeah, I kind of know that. And then I, I bring up some of our, our church's desires to um, kind of step into responding to crisis care more, and her face lit up. Like, who, who, like whose face lights up when you say the word crisis? <laughs> but 
this girl because that's how God wired her, and that's what God is, has stirred in her, and Holy Spirit's awakening in her. Let me throw another, another question at you of, of Holy Spirit empowering you. Can you think of a time when you felt stirred or propelled or compelled to do something, to say something, to volunteer for something, maybe even which ended up being surprises to, your, to others or even to yourself, and you may not have expected it. You just kind of found yourself there. That's Holy Spirit, right? That's what it can start looking like when we find ourselves with our hand up volunteering for something even before you have a time to talk yourself out of it. Right, Lori? (laughs) Ask Lori how she ended up on the refugee team. When you start talking with someone at work about church or Jesus, even though your armpits are sweaty and you want to run away, but you can't kind of stop yourself. It's just kind of coming out of you. That's Holy Spirit awakening something in you. When you end up standing on this very platform asking for prayer after service, breaking down in tears because you just know you want more. When maybe it looks like when when you've your days are long and and you're already tired and, and you're exhausted and you've got nothing left, but you get a phone call from a neighbor in trouble, and somehow you find you have another three hours in you left to give. That's Holy Spirit. That's what being empowered by the Holy Spirit can sometimes look like. So again, what stirs you? What's Holy Spirit empowering in you? What's Holy Spirit empowering in you? You see, later on um, in the story, Jonathan and, and the army, it, get, it gets crazy cool. I encourage you to check out the story. He, he turns to the armor bearer. He says, let's go. And, and they go to face the Philistine army, just the two of them, and they devise this plan. And if they say this, then that means God's favor is on us, so then we're going to go. Um, and um, they end up getting to the first kind of batch, the outpost army, and there's about 20 of them. And Jonathan and the armor bearer end up kind of destroying all of them and having victory. And then that was enough. Um, the Holy Spirit then, God sends kind of chaos and panic amongst the rest of the hundreds of the Philistine army. So then when Saul and the other Israelite army um, kind of catch up what's going on, they get there and the Philistines were all in panic, killing each other, and God saves Israel this kind of crazy, supernatural, whoa, like how could that happen? These two guys and all this kind of happening. And, and sometimes when we picture Holy Spirit empowering us, we picture, picture the final kind of battle scene of victory. And, and absolutely, that is, that is what happens when we step out. But sometimes we have a hard time figuring out how do we get to that point? And as much as obviously all those things were the act of God and the power of the Holy Spirit at work to be able to gain that victory, that first nudge and first stirring in Jonathan's heart was the Holy Spirit at work as well. So again, what, what dreams are in your heart? What, what stirs you? Are there, are there things in your heart that you need to be awakened to? Um, uh, a, a lot of some of this teaching and learning um, has, has been really reflected well as, as Calvary's been stepping into this. Um, Banning Leapshire, the pastor of Jesus Culture, also has some really great resources. And, and he says, the dreams in your heart are one of the main ways God awakens you. God stirs you. God moves you. But I think too many of us have stopped dreaming. I know I have. I recognize in conversations or, or in reflection times. Maybe it's the, the realist in me. As you get older, you kind of go, well, that's silly. Right? Or, or maybe, maybe, you know, in some of my wisdom or in some of my, my relationship with God, God has, has sifted through some of, some of what I would have thought were dreams, and, and he's helped me let go of ones that were may, maybe were just wishes or, or just different pictures But I have to be careful to not let my past experiences, my perceived failures, 
or the timing of God stop me from remembering that I have a role to play in the outcome of the game. I can't stop dreaming, because when we stop dreaming, we stop moving, we stop leaning in, and we stop listening to the Holy Spirit. And I don't want to just stick with the comfortable plays. We probably know, like, okay, I could think of, like, the one thing that I can do well, and I'll, I'll serve, check, and then that was my stick handle, and then I'm just going to go back and sit in, the, sit in the bench. We can't just get comfortable. We need to continue to lean in. But I, but I recognize that maybe, maybe you've, you've tried something before. You've tried to listen to a nudge or, or step into a dream. Maybe you tried to go after something, run after something, or even just sought personal breakthrough in your life for a particular um, area. And, and you kind of were like, okay, and, and then it didn't happen. <laughs> and then, or it didn't look like you hoped or in the timing that you hoped, and so you got discouraged or disillusioned or disappointed. And then, if you're like me, and you kind of put up walls or you kind of step back because you, you lose a little hope and you lose a little trust in yourself and in if that was really God. And, and remember, I remember if you were, you were here, I talked a year or so ago about the, the words discourage and disappointment. When you take courage and, and, and dis is taking out, so when, when you have disappointment, you're taking out your courage. Or when, especially in, in this message, when you have live in disappointment, you're taking out, you're robbing yourself of your appointment if you live in disappointment. I always start off the, the, the running group um, sharing that our heart is to remind ourselves that we have both a kingdom assignment. I think this is one of the slides there, Steve. A kingdom identity, who God made you to be, and your kingdom assignment, who God made you, what God made you to do. Think about those two things. You have a kingdom assignment. Oh, sorry, you have a kingdom identity. Who God calls you who he made you be. And everyone has a kingdom assignment. What has God made you to do? Now, doers, don't jump to that second one and just go, okay, that's my checklist thing. No, they're both birthed out of that awakening, out of that dreaming, out of the breath and presence of the Holy Spirit. And when we stop dreaming, when we stop inviting Holy Spirit to stir, when we stop creating that space for Holy Spirit to do, when we stop listening, we stop moving. We stop moving into our kingdom identity. We stop moving into our kingdom assignment, a.k.a. we get stuck. Right? Don't, slight tangent here, don't hear me when I say, a season of rest or a season of healing is the same as being stuck, okay? So if you feel God is moving you into a season of rest or moving you into a season of still or moving you into a season of restoration, that's still moving. What I'm talking about is when you find yourself stuck where you're no longer pursuing your kingdom identity and kingdom assignment and allowing Holy Spirit to breathe on that. I've been, I've been hearing the word awaken all over the place lately. It's like, you know, one of those times when you're like, I'm going to buy a red car, a certain kind, and then you see it everywhere, right? And you're like, suddenly, I'm seeing it everywhere. That, that's for me, it's been the word awaken. Been seeing it in new songs that have been coming out, and our, our prophets in the house have been talking about awakening and, and, um, and just different teachings and, and different words. And even just in the the spring season, there's just this sense of awakening. And you can put this this, um, statement up because I want to make it a declaration. Uh, I believe that God is wanting to awaken us to dreams and to his heart. I believe that God is wanting to awaken us. And and maybe, um, maybe for some of us, that first step 
maybe is allowing Holy Spirit to heal and restore any wounds or disappointments that we might have from past experiences, um, from other times, so that we can dream again. That's why the word restore has so much weight and so much importance. That's why all of these things are, are interwoven. We need to be a body that creates space for, for restoration and recognize that we are empowered when we step into restoration. So don't rule yourself out of Holy Spirit moving in you and using you when you feel tired or not together. Because friends, I can tell you, if that was the case, I would not be up here <laughs> this morning. It was a tough slog this week. It was still like yesterday that God pieced some pieces together. So I could have easily and probably did at certain points and Kelly and Drew had to be like, no, you're good, you're good. <laughs> Where I could have just checked out and said, I don't have anything to say. <laughs> I'm in the restored phase right now. So like, I'm just going to use this week to reset. Yes, and God wants to continue to move and stir. So we are empowered even when we have to be restored. Or, or maybe more like this, where you're like, I don't, it's not so much restored that I need. I just have kind of stopped moving and allowed God to awaken me because I feel like my dreams and nudges from God are, are too big or too ridiculous, too ridiculous or, or too much. Like maybe that's, you've been, so that's a little too much, Right? So they're probably then actually not from God, and I'm probably just being whimsical, and I'm probably just, right? And we limit God, but maybe more accurately, we limit God within us. We believe that God has the power to do it, but we, we forget that he actually wants to partner with us, or we don't want to believe that he would actually want to partner with us. Um, let's throw that, that next scripture up. Jonathan says in verse 6, when before they're making their way up, they're about to trek up to face the army. And he says, this is the message version. Maybe God will work for us. There's no rule that says um, he can only deliver us by using a big army. No one can stop God from saving when he sets his mind to it. You see, Jonathan has that confidence. Jonathan, Jonathan recognizes that it's not him, that it's not his strength, that it's not his might. He would be a little disillusioned to think that he, two people, could, could win, but he, he heads into that posh, with a posture of, well, of course, Holy Spirit can do what he wants. God can do it all. And if we head into whatever dream, whatever um, pathway, whatever calling God is stirring in us, whether it's something in our own lives that he wants to break through or for the sake of the world, when we start recognizing, just like Drew said, it's not by our might, not by our power, but by the Holy Spirit, how can we not win? How can we not be bold if we have that same confidence, that same posture that Jonathan had? Jesus says in Matthew that with man things can be possible, but with God all things are possible. With God, all things are possible. And that's what the Holy Spirit is. We aren't apart from him. That's what being empowered is. When we're empowered by the Holy Spirit, when we're in relationship with him, when we're inviting him into our time, into our thoughts, into our schedule, into our, into our listening he empowers us. He, he inflates us is the word, the picture that I came to mind as I was writing. He builds us bigger. He awakens us. And in a season, in a year where it's been easy to kind of feel small, to kind of feel weary, to kind of feel like our eyes are kind of always living at a dim, I declare that this is a season for awakening. And that Calvary is being reawakened once again with the spring, with this new thing. Just like Angie said, see, I am doing a new thing. So I want you just, I want to just have, take, a, take a moment. Let's just make this personal. 
Who is God calling you to be? As a father, as a mother, as a, as a teacher, as a student, as a neighbor, who is he calling you to be? And what is God calling you to do? What is God wanting to awake within you? And it may start with just a nudge or a stirring or a prompting. Maybe there's a name or a person. Maybe an idea. Maybe there's a cause of injustice or an issue. Maybe it's a Bible verse or a song or a recent sermon that resonates that you can't get out of your head, that rallies you, that stirs you, that awakens you. Don't ignore that. That's the Holy Spirit. That's the Holy Spirit stirring in you, speaking to you, inviting you to partner with him. So let's go on a journey towards him, towards that calling. And don't just take that, that, that nudge and run with it on your own. Invite Holy Spirit to breathe into that dream. So even as we just um, transition into some, some worship now to allow Holy Spirit to breathe, breathe on these thoughts that are ruminating, breathe on these nudges and, and remembering that God speaks to us in different ways. So for some of us, it's going to come as we're reflecting throughout the week. Others, it's, it's going to even just be a physical sensation right now. Others, there's going to be a name or a memory that's popping into your head. And let's just invite Holy Spirit to breathe onto who we are, onto our identity, both our strengths and our weaknesses, our failures and our victories, what he calls us so that we can be bold and courageous like Jonathan, knowing that we serve the God of possibilities. We are walking with a God who is empowering us, stirring us, and at work with us. So Holy Spirit, awaken those dreams, stir our hearts, and with your power, your breath, your presence, we step into the game. And God, we're thankful that even Jonathan had an armor bearer. God, we want to do this together. We want to do this alongside one another. God, thank you that this is a community that is committing to walking alongside one another with you. So Holy Spirit, as we look to you, as we sing, may your spirit breathe upon our dreams, upon our nudges, upon our stirrings, knowing that you, God, are the God of the possible, God of the impossible things. So come, Holy Spirit, come, awaken us. So there's, um, I'm just going to get Dave to keep playing. So there's this many times in scripture where somebody like Hannah pleading for a child because she knows that God wants to birth something through her. Where David or Jonathan feel a stirring and they lay it before God and say, God, I will move and you, if you move through. I'll start, and then you move. Peter steps out onto the top of the boat and says, Jesus, call me to walk to you, and he walks on the water. God wants to empower our steps through our stirring, and so I want to invite us now, wherever we are, what are you laying before God and saying, I'm stepping into this. Move through me. What dream are you placing that I'm saying, here I am? Move through me. What identity? God, I, I don't want to be that quiet person in the corner who doesn't speak up anymore. I'm going to move, move through me. God, I don't want to be the person who lets fear control me. I'm stepping into this. God, you're asking me to restore. I'm laying this before you. I'm stepping into this. Move through me. People of God, each of us right now has the opportunity to lay before God something that he is going to empower.
Sometimes he moves and then we get to respond. Many times he stirs in us, that's his moving, so that we can say okay and then he moves in power. God, every fear, every thought about our past, the times we tried and it didn't work, all these things we lay before you and we are going to declare if you are for us, who can be against us? If you are with us, what can stand? Because it's your ministry, your dreams that you are doing in us and through us. <laughs> How can we lose? We're going to play a bit and then I'm going to invite you to sing this as a as your own prayer, your own declaration. God, we rise. And I hear you saying, do whatever is in your heart and I will be with you. the math thing. So may you go into this week letting God awaken you to dreams that you didn't even know you had. Be alert to his nudges, to his pokes. And may the God who is bigger, stronger than it all walk with you into your every day. And we don't get to have to do it alone, even this morning. We've got Angie over here. If you want to release, we've got our prayer team online. Or if you just want to talk, here's a question for you in the uh, Coffee Hour Zoom room. What stirs you? What, what's God maybe awakening in you? What's been a sweet spot? Whether it be a conversation as you head out into the sunshine and some fellowship with those here in person or on the Zoom room, both links are there. Let's, let's stir one another on to awakening to dreams. So have a great, great week, everyone. We'll see you next week or during the week. God bless you.